Grace, mercy, and peace be with you all from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Did you happen to notice that our first reading today was the entire book of Philemon? So if you are in a book club, or if you have pledged that you are going to read one book a week, you can check it off your list. You just did. It is, of course, a letter from Paul to a man named Philemon, and it's only 335 words long in its original text. Oh, but it is a very important letter. Paul wrote this letter from prison in Rome, under guard, in a house, and in chains. Paul had a crucial life-giving, uh, life-and-death matter to bring to the attention of his fellow Christian who had lived in the city of Colossae. This letter addresses slavery, so it may be helpful for us to know that about a third of the people in the Roman Empire of Paul's day were slaves. Roman slavery was not race-based as it was in the Americas. People could become slaves by birth, by criminal punishment, or military conquest, or voluntarily becoming a slave to pay a debt. Some became trusted servants and confidants. Some ran businesses to their own or their master's benefit. Their lives were, of course, harder and often shorter than freed people. To run away was a crime that could be punished by death. In the early church, both masters and slaves were Christians, and it would not be unusual for the whole household to gather together in a place of worship. This is the world that Paul lived in. With that in mind, let's look at this little letter. It's so brief, it's kind of easy to miss. So let me just tell you that in your pew Bibles, it is part of page 1088. I invite you to follow along page 1088. You might want to start at the back and work your way forward a little bit. In the first verses, we hear Paul's greeting to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. And also to Afia, our sister, thought to be his wife, traditionally the one in charge of the household, including the slaves, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, probably their son, and also to the church in your house. So we learn that Philemon is dear to Paul, and he is a wealthy person with a large enough house that a portion of the Colossian church can gather there for worship and fellowship. He greets them all with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the letter shifts, and now, starting with verse 4, Paul is speaking specifically to Philemon. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. And we hear all of Paul's gratitude for who Philemon is, his love, his faith, his encouragement. He has refreshed the hearts of the saints, which means that he is generous to others. And this is all very high praise from Paul. Then, starting in verse 8, we learn Paul's main purpose for writing this letter. For this reason, because Philemon is a kind and faithful believer in Jesus, for this reason, though I am more than bold enough in Christ to command you to do the right thing, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul certainly had the authority to order Philemon to do the right thing. But notice, he does not call himself an apostle in this letter. Instead, he treads gently, and he appeals to Philemon on three grounds. Love for God and each other, that he is getting up there in age and could use a little help, and that he is in chains under guard. The man has suffered a lot. And now we come to the heart of the matter, Onesimus. We continue in verse 10. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. 
Paul says he has become his father, which means that there in prison, Paul has shared Jesus with Onesimus, who has become a Christian believer. And Paul is writing to Philemon because this new believer is actually Philemon's slave. What kind of a slave is he? Was he working off debt? Was he a slave for life? We don't know. But most scholars believe that he had run away from Philemon, traveled a thousand miles from Colossae to Rome, a big city where he could disappear, but somehow in God's big plan came to Paul and then came to Jesus. And now Paul thinks of Onesimus as his own spiritual son. This is a strong expression of honor towards someone who is typically thought of as property. Verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Here Paul gives us a play on words. You see, the name Onesimus means useful. Apparently, in his former life in Colossae, serving Philemon, Onesimus did not shine. He was useless. And when he came to faith in Jesus, he changed. About this verse, William Barclay, Scottish theologian from the last century, wrote, It is significant to note that Paul claims that in Christ, the useless person Onesimus has been made useful. The last thing that Christianity is designed to produce is vague, inefficient, dreamy, nebulous people. It produces people who are of use, people who have a grip of things. Barclay had opinions. Onesimus, Paul writes, is now useful. And then we hear something surprising in verse 12. He says, I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. Sending him back. Although running away was a serious and punishable crime, he was so dear to Paul that it was like sending away part of his heart. But perhaps even in Rome, Onesimus would always be looking over his shoulder, waiting to be arrested, living as a fugitive. Verse 13 Paul says, I wanted to keep him with me so that he might minister to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed, and he'll get to what that is in a moment, might be voluntary, not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you. That's very delicate language for a slave running away. He was separated from you for a time so that you might have him back for the long term. And now listen carefully. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Paul makes his appeal to Philemon, and he makes it out of love, not coercion, that Philemon do a great good deed by his own choice, that he would receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother in Christ. This is a new thing, my friends. This is radical. Philemon's head probably exploded when he read these words delivered by his slave. Verse 17. So, Philemon, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. And do you hear how closely Paul is standing alongside Onesimus? If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. What was owed may refer to Philemon's lost labor when Onesimus left. Or that when he ran away, Onesimus stole funds to fund his flight. At any rate, Paul will repay it. Whatever it is, how much it is, Paul will repay it. And he's written that in his own hand. 
And then, with a bit of a zinger, Paul says, I say nothing about you owing me, even your own self. Well, Paul, I think you just did. Here Paul reminds Philemon that he owed Paul his own spiritual life and his eternal salvation since he heard the good news of Jesus Christ from Paul. And verse 20, Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I'm writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Now, useful and benefit come from the same word that results in the name Onesimus. So we have another play on words here, and what Paul is saying is this. Let me have Onesimus back from you in the Lord. It will refresh my heart as you have refreshed the hearts of others. And then verse 22, Paul expressed his hope to visit Philemon again. We don't know that this visit happened, but if it did, obviously Paul would see Philemon's decision with his own eyes. And then he gave his closing greetings and benediction, and the letter ends. And Paul put the letter in Onesimus' hands. And he makes the long journey back to Philemon and presented Paul's letter. Then what happened when he got there? What did Philemon do? Did he receive Onesimus as a brother in Christ, no longer as a slave, as Paul had asked? Well, we don't actually know, but we have some clues that Philemon came through. First, the letter exists. If Philemon thought the great Paul had gone too far, that he had lost his mind, he would have just tossed the letter. Instead, it was saved, and it was read widely. And we know this because we just read it in our Bible. Second, Ignatius, bishop of Antioch, some 50 years later, wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus about their bishop and a visit that had happened some time earlier. He wrote, I have received in God's name your whole congregation in the person of one Onesimus, a man of inexpressible love who is your earthly bishop. In this same letter, Ignatius often uses language that sounds like it is taken from that letter to Philemon linking Bishop Onesimus to former slave Onesimus. And third, there is also historical evidence that the many letters that Paul wrote that were distributed to so many different churches in many places were first gathered into a group in the city of Ephesus. Perhaps Bishop Onesimus of that city was part of that process and he made sure that his letter, his charter of freedom, the letter to Philemon, was included. However it happened, I am so grateful that this letter is in our Bible. One scholar wrote, what the letter to Philemon does is to bring the institution of slavery into an atmosphere where it could only wilt and die if you are my brother or my sister in Christ, how can you be my slave? A final thought for us today. In this letter, we see the good news of Jesus Christ changing individuals and changing relationships and changing history. We still live in a divided and broken world, and we belong to many social networks where Everyone does not have the same status. In a world where so many struggle, may we all be changed by our Savior too. May we remember, along with Philemon, that the gospel makes us family, partners, fellow workers. May we choose to find in each other brothers and sisters bearing God's image, redeemed by the same grace of God. And in that finding, may the world be a better place. In the name of Jesus, amen.